Good morning, everyone. We have a very uh, active, full, and robust schedule of activity this week. House Democrats are continuing uh, to promote and move forward our For the People agenda in kitchen table pocketbook issues designed to make life better for every day Americans. The other side has proven they fight for the wealthy, the well-off, and the well-connected. We fight for working families, middle class folks, senior citizens, the poor, the sick, the afflicted, veterans, and vulnerable Americans all across the United States of America. The President's declaration is a phony, fraudulent, and fake national emergency. There is no crisis at the border. The President's actions are manufactured, manipulative, and represent a misappropriation of taxpayer resources inconsistent with the United States Constitution. There is no crisis at our southern border. There is no basis in law or in fact to declare a national emergency. There is no increase in illegal crossings at our border. There is no increase in criminal activity at our border. There is no increase in drug trafficking at our border. There is no evidence that terrorists are coming into the United States of America along our southern border. President Donald Trump has more stories than Harry Potter, and all of them are make-believe. That is why House Democrats are proceeding with a resolution of disapproval with respect to this fake national emergency. This week, we will also be introducing H.R. 4, part of our promise to fix and restore the Voting Rights Act in the United States of America. There is nothing more central to the integrity of our democracy than making sure that every single American has a right to vote. And so we're thankful for the leadership of Terry Sewell and John Lewis and Jim Clyburn and so many others uh, who are working to make sure that we address the egregious Supreme Court decision from 2013 that undermined the ability of everyday Americans to participate in our democracy and ushered in a new era of voter suppression in the United States of America. House Democrats are gonna make sure that we end that practice. We are also focused on advancing an agenda supported by the overwhelming majority of the American people on gun safety and gun violence prevention. And we've been joined by several distinguished leaders in that effort, let me now yield to someone who's been a champion for gun safety, our distinguished Vice Chair, Catherine Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today. On tomorrow, for the first time in over a decade, uh, House Democrats will vote on a gun safety reform bill. We have been partaking in a grisly ritual. We have a mass shooting, we have a moment of silence, and then there has been inaction. This signifies the end of that and a chance to say to the American people, we understand that we wanna keep our neighborhoods safe and that we can do this in a bipartisan way with support of over 95% of the American people across ideologies who say it is common sense to keep guns out of the hands of dangerous people. That is what the two bills that we will be taking up this week will do. One is comprehensive uh, background checks. The other is closing the Charleston loophole, which allowed the shooter in that tragic case to be able to get a gun he was not entitled to. The inaction has come to an end. It is part of our For the People agenda. It is part of what we heard clearly from the American people in the midterms. And part of the result of those midterm elections 
was an outstanding new member of Congress whose personal loss and tragedy of her son Jordan has propelled her to be a um, gun violence um, safety advocate. And we are very proud today to be joined by Representative Lucy McBath. Good morning, everyone. This week marks a very pivotal moment in the gun violence prevention movement and in the fight to make our communities and our nation a safer place. Thank you to Congressman Thompson, Speaker Pelosi, Chairman Nadler, and the more than 230 of my colleagues who have co-sponsored H.R. 8. I am so very proud to be an original co-sponsor of this historic legislation. And thank you to Whip Clyburn and my colleagues sponsoring support for H.R. 1112. Together we are truly making meaningful changes and putting forth common sense solutions to make our nation safer. Today we want to say thank you. Thank you to the student activists who have turned their pain into change. Thank you to my colleagues who have shown a commitment to protecting our communities day after day after day. As these two federal background check bills head to the House floor with bipartisan support for the very first time, it is reflective of our changing national conversation around gun violence. We can prevent gun deaths, and together we will make our nation a safer place for our communities and our children. House Democrats, I assure you, are committed to bringing an end to gun violence. I truly hope that our friends in the Senate will join us because American lives depend on it. I want to thank uh, Lucy for her very distinguished leadership on this issue. Uh, she has turned her pain into progress for the American people. We're joined by another very distinguished member of the freshman class uh, who has done the same as a result of personal tragedy and committed uh, herself uh, to the cause of improving gun safety on behalf of all Americans. Let me now yield uh, to my friend, the distinguished gentlelady lady from Florida, Debbie McCarcel Powell. Thank you, uh, Representative Jeffries, Representative Clark, for bringing this issue to light and helping lift the voices of Americans impacted by the gun violence epidemic in this country. As some of you may already know, this is a very personal issue for me as well. Um, I am never going to forget the day that I received the phone call when I was 24 years old telling me that my father was shot and killed by a criminal with a gun. Unfortunately, thousands of Americans in this country now share the same story as mine. The pain that I feel when we discuss this issue here today, when I hear the news of the mass shootings in Parkland, Orlando, Aurora last week is still there. And I remember my father always talking to me about when he would walk me down the aisle. And I will never forget that he was not there that day. When I took the oath of office, I made a promise that I would not stop until we finally passed common sense gun reform. I owed that promise to my father and to so many families in my community who have lost loved ones to gun violence. This week we will be voting on, and it is my hope that we will pass two critical pieces of common sense gun reform re legislation, H.R. 8 and H.R. 1112. We all know that most Americans, over 95% of Americans, support universal background checks. In my district, we have some of the highest rates of gun violence for kids under the age of 18. And we also have two of the largest gun shows in America. H.R. 8 addresses that issue and it closes that gun show loophole. If these bills can save precious lives from being the next victims of gun violence, then the effort is well worth it. We made a promise to the American people to make our community safer and this is a promise fulfilled this week. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. And let me now yield to uh, my friend, a man who has been a champion uh, for gun violence prevention here in the United States, House of Representatives, 
uh, the lead sponsor of H.R. 8, uh, someone who has credibility on this issue given his service to this country, uh, given the district that he represents and his authentic commitment to making life better on the issue of gun violence. Uh, distinguished gentleman from California, Mike Thompson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Madam Vice Chair, and my two new colleagues uh, who are just a wonderful bright spot in this new class and in our uh, new Congress. Uh, thank you for all the work that you're doing and the commitment that you bring uh, to this issue. For the last six and a half years, I've worked on the issue of expanding background checks before someone can buy a gun. The, it wasn't one day a week, it wasn't once in a while, it was part of every day for six and a half years. For six and a half years, we had no cooperation from the past majority. We couldn't get a hearing on the bill, we couldn't get a vote on the bill. Today, we're here to tell you that it's a new day. With this new majority, we have made a commitment to address the issue of gun violence. The first bill that will be brought up, H.R. 8, I learned uh, when it was in the Judiciary Committee when it passed, it was the first time that the Judiciary Committee has passed a gun violence prevention bill of consequence in the last 26 years. This is a big step to make sure that our communities are safer. Universal background checks will ensure that people that try and buy a gun will go through a background check. It's our first line of defense in making certain that people who want to buy a gun and shouldn't have a gun don't get access to that firearm. This is important. We have 232 co-authors. It's bipartisan, Democrats and Republicans. And tomorrow, we'll send that bill with a strong vote to the United States Senate. And then, all of the passion that our two new members talked about today, all of the young people across the country who don't want to be victims of gun violence, all of their parents who don't want their kids to be victims of gun violence, everyone who has brought us to this point can then focus their attention on the Senate and make sure that the will of the people is heard and we get that bill heard over on the Senate side. So thank you all for being here. Thank you to my colleagues for all that you've done to make this a reality. Thank you, Mike. The gun violence epidemic in the United States of America is an actual national emergency. The days of this House burying its head in the sand are now over. Uh, let me now uh, open it up for any questions. Sure, and I'm going to yield to uh, Mike Thompson and any of the other members who want to respond, but this is a important step in the right direction. It is a beginning to address a national epidemic with respect to gun violence in the United States of America. The overwhelming majority of the American people support universal criminal background check legislation because it's the right thing to do. We need to close the gun show loophole. We need to close the internet sale loophole. That's what we are doing. Well, I'll just add that um, any time the other side says that this isn't enforceable without a national registry, that's a code word for they want to do a national registry. And it's important to note in H.R. 8, it specifies that there is nothing in this bill that can be used to establish a national registry. And no, they're wrong about that. Every day, 170 felons and 50 domestic abusers are stopped from buying a gun at licensed dealers because of the background check. It works. We know it works. There's a lot of evidence out there that suggests or that, that clarifies the fact that it works. And as far as anybody who says, well, this bill wouldn't have solved this, uh, this incident, 
the only thing that will solve every one is to do away with guns. So are you telling me that the critics of my bill want to do away with all guns? I just uh, want to address what we hear as well, that exactly what um, Congressman Thompson just said, that this idea that we should do nothing because no one bill will prevent all gun violence is absurd. And we have to look no further than the ban that Republicans upheld on research on how to best solve gun violence in this country. So if you were serious about this and feel that comprehensive background checks is not the answer, then you would fund research into what is the correct answer. The hypocrisy is, um, is so blatant here and we cannot be afraid to take a step we don't have the cure for any chronic disease at the beginning, but you do it by pieces and by research and developing. We know that background checks work. They keep guns out of the hands of dangerous people. That's what we're gonna be voting for this week. That's what the American people are asking Congress to do. I support the notion uh, that we need to take a comprehensive look uh, generally at how we can uh, get to a place where we have universal access to high quality affordable health care for every single American. That is the principle that unites the House Democratic Caucus. We have been clear as part of our For the People agenda that the starting point should be working to lower the high cost of life-saving prescription drugs. We believe uh, that we should give Medicare the ability to use its bulk price purchasing power to negotiate higher, lower drug prices on behalf of the American people. That's a starting point. We want to protect people with pre-existing conditions. We want to strengthen the Affordable Care Act as a foundation. Uh, there has not been any discussion in the caucus. Right now, we're focused on dealing with this man-made, manufactured, manipulative, so-called national emergency that is really just designed to fulfill a campaign applause line connected uh, to a medieval border wall that the president claimed Mexico would pay for it. This whole thing is outrageous and is inconsistent with the United States Constitution and the allocation of the power of spending to the Congress. Yeah, I'm going to yield to my colleagues, but I think our focus right now is on HR 8 and H.R. 1112. Well, the Gun Violence Prevention Task Force is still alive and well, and we will continue to uh, hold our meetings. We'll continue to hear from the experts. We'll continue to hear from the researchers, and we'll continue to look for ways that we can make our community safer uh, from gun violence. We have a pretty uh, aggressive schedule ahead of us where we're going to have people come in uh, to meet with us. Uh, we're looking at holding a public hearing so we can hear from uh, experts in the field to come in and talk to uh, our task force and other members of Congress. And based on that, we'll decide where we go from there. Oh, we've got a ton of things identified, <laughs> but uh, we're, we're going to do it in a, reg in a in regular order, figure out uh, what will work, what will reduce gun violence, uh, what we can uh, bring forward uh, with a confidence that we will reduce uh, gun violence in our communities.
On an end to, you know, piggyback on what my colleague has just said is that, you know, having been an advocate with and doing a lot of work in gun violence prevention advocacy, we know that, you know, background checks for all gun sales is just one way to deter the expansive culture that we're living in, but also extreme risk protection orders, which people call red flag laws. Child access prevention is going to be extremely critical because the number one way that children are killing themselves is access to a gun. Uh, also to conceal carry reciprocity. We know that the NRA gun lobby, this is, their, this is their number one agenda to make sure that the weakest law of the land becomes the law of the land all over. Anyone, whether or not they have access, I mean, uh, whether or not they have a permit to carry or whether or not they have a background check for carrying that gun or whether or not they actually have training. The NRA gun lobby's goal is to make sure that anyone can carry from state to state whether or not the state that they're going to has stricter gun laws. So there are a number of ways that my colleagues and I will be working as, as you know, uh, uh, Mike has said, is that, you know, we're going to critically take our time and look at everything, making sure that we're not infringing upon people's ability to, to own guns. We're not about infringing upon people's Second Amendment rights to protect their families and their children and their territories, but we have to make sure that we are critically looking at the laws, making sure that they are common sense, and also looking for bipartisan support. Thank you. Well, the American people deserve to know whether Donald Trump has been functioning as the President of the United States of America or as the equivalent of an organized crime boss. Michael Cohen can shed some light on that very important question. I'm sorry, yes. Justice Brandeis has made the point that sunlight is the best disinfectant. Clearly, there's no one closer to Donald Trump uh, with respect to his business practices, not month after month, not year after year, but decade after decade, than Donald Trump and his relationship with Michael Cohen. And so what we need to hear from Michael Cohen is that information presented in a transparent fashion, and the American people can make a decision uh, from there. We're focused on Plan A right now, which is to make sure that we have a strongly bipartisan vote with respect to the resolution of disapproval. Uh, and we are urging our colleagues to not just talk the talk with respect to the House as a separate and co-equal branch of government, but walking the walk. The president, in this particular instance, is behaving more like a king. That is inconsistent with what James Madison and the Founding Fathers expected out of the executive branch. The Founding Fathers were clear that when the executive branch overreaches, it's the job of the United States Congress as a separate and co-equal branch of government to serve as a check and balance. The resolution of disapproval with respect to Donald Trump's fake national emergency is consistent with that constitutional responsibility. That is what we're focused on right now. Any further questions? Thank you very much.